happy Thanksgiving week. It's that it's that holiday that kind of gets overlooked in the middle of everything, doesn't it? Uh, the stores have gone all toward Christmas, right, from Halloween. <laughs> and as soon as Christmas is over, we'll be right to, uh, right to Valentine's Day, I'm sure. Uh, but it is a week to be thankful, a week to remember <clears throat> how good God is, and, and He's the giver of all these good gifts. Today we're going to look a little more at, at the gift of the Holy Spirit, His presence among us. How awesome is that? And some of you are saying, I, I don't know anything about that personally, right? I know the stories. I know about Pentecost. I know about that the Spirit came down. I know that, that His um, presence is supposed to be with us. But what does that look like? And um, we want to explore just a little bit more about that today, um, especially as we go into these holiday uh, gatherings. You might, you might have gatherings coming up that you're a little bit stressed about. And so we'll give you some advice on how to, <laughs> how to get through um, some of that as well uh, as we sing together, as we uh, pray together, take communion together. So if, if you want to take communion with me later, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a time set aside. So if you can grab a, a little bit of bread and and if you've got some grape juice, that'd be great, um, or something like that. So you can we can uh, pray together and and take to remember Jesus. Let's do that together, and uh, we're so excited about that. Um, reminder: uh, we're coming up on January soon, and in this new year, we're going to start a training center for disciple making disciples. Disciple making disciples. So training disciples who can make disciples. And this comes at a time when m many of you are struggling to try to put together, okay, I love my family and friends. I love the, the people around me in my neighborhood, but I don't know how to communicate the gospel like Peter did with Cornelius, as we've been studying. I, don't, I wouldn't know how to do that. But, but like Cornelius, you may have a huge household of people. You're just trying to figure out, like, I don't know. Like, what would you say or how would you do that? And, and how would we live in such a way that God could use us in those things? And many Christians are just kind of holding up their hands saying, I guess it's not for me. Well, let me tell you this. I'm willing to give you my best time if you will give me your best time. And on Sunday nights and on Tuesday morning, two separate times that you can kind of enter, <laughs> go in between, we're going to launch this training center and I will be there to help you and train you. And, and help you see a movement of God in your household like Cornelius did in his. So that's what I'm offering to you. So you, you can start emailing me. We can start having this conversation. We've been doing this, this conversation in a discipleship practicum where we just hear the word of God, put it into action, follow up with what we did, and then hear the word of God and just keep going. And that's the model uh, with some new material that we'll be doing in our training center coming up in January. So stay tuned for that. Um, we love you guys. We're so thankful that you're hanging in there with us. Um, of course, if you're healthy, um, you can come. We have, we have room in our, in our Sunday morning gathering at 1030 a.m. You're always uh, welcome to come. But we understand, and so we're going to continue to, uh, to, to see you in this way as well. But may God bless you as you um, just share some time together with us to explore the Word and to sing and uh, make your hearts thankful. That's a choice. You know, be thankful to God for how good and gracious he is as the giver of all good gifts. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry.
walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. God so loved the world. As we get ready for the holidays, you know, you're probably thinking about maybe holiday conversations. For those of you that get to join with family, I get that's, that's an issue for all sorts of people uh, not being able to get together with family. But for those that are approaching, okay, what's this get together going to be, even if it's on a uh, web camera service or something like that, you know, you're imagining uh, getting together and the dialogue and what are we going to talk about and, and is this the time to take your stand, <laughs> you know? And people are taking their stand against all sorts of things and for all sorts of things. You know, the theory is, you know, you just got to stand your ground and and uh, at least that's the way it looks on social media. And even in the family conversations, you know, that are coming up, the, the local news media outlets are all offering tips for how to navigate the minefields of holiday gatherings. You know, is it is it just agree to disagree? Well, that's that's civil. That sounds civil. Uh, but is that the best, you know, best that they can they can offer? You know, it could work for a bit. Um, or just focus on the turkey and the pumpkin pie and, and just get out of there, you know, or just be thankful. Well, that's, that's good. And maybe that's all you can do if you're dead set on taking a stand about a political issue. But Jesus didn't ask you to die on that hill. No, he died on that hill far away to reconcile people to the Father and to each other at the foot of that old rugged cross. And when we get up from kneeling at that emblem of suffering and shame, we stand to declare our love for Jesus and the love of Jesus for us lost sinners. Right? We stand for, for Jesus. Now, the story of Jesus does not unite all people. We, we know that. Many will reject him. But, but that's on them, really, the rejection of Jesus. But for those Jesus rescues and purifies and indwells by his spirit, which is what we've been looking at, there is a unity based on the declaration of Jesus as Lord. There's a unity already there. And there's no other entry point to the family other than allegiance to Jesus which is followed then, you know, by repentance, followed with the indwelling of the Spirit. And this entry point is not a political code or a, or a set of cultural values or traditions. The entry point has nothing to do with your place in society or the color of your skin, but rather with the location of your loyalty. Jesus as Lord, right? The gospel is an all call that requires a response of allegiance, which is trust, or you might say faith, in Jesus. 
And that is the entry point to the family. And we cannot waver on that. That's where our true unity lies. In this Acts series, we've been looking at the basic understanding of the Jewish people, how they would respond with their allegiance to Jesus. They're the keepers of the covenant of Abraham, which was made more explicit in the covenant of Moses. Circumcision, food, and purity laws were, were boundary markers for them. The covenant couldn't be more explicit, right? And so eating with the Gentiles, as we looked at in this passage, is not easy to digest. And soon the word would go from, um, from Caesarea, where the centurion and his family and household was, to Jerusalem. When that happened, it was a scandal. And so we want to look at Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18 today. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea, that's all that region around Jerusalem, heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. And when he went, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Okay, so Tom Wright says it's, it's, the, it's the hospitality which had initially worried this circumcision group since it broke the taboos we've been mentioning. But clearly the major concern, which if allowed to stand, would blow a hole right through the worldview of the circumcision group, it was that these Gentiles had been admitted as full members of the new and rapidly developing Jesus family without having to become Jews in the process. We've discussed this a bit in our recent sermons. You know, it seems that... <clears throat> God has actually set up this encounter for Peter to be able to communicate to the Jerusalem crowd, the, the, the followers of Jesus, about his work. That, that if, if they hadn't addressed it, he wouldn't have been able to, to share this, this amazing story. Peter's opportunity comes with the accusation, which is sometimes hard to, to take, the accusation, right? It, but it might not have come otherwise. In his defense... He points to the Trinity in action. Another time where we see the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. This is what they were doing. He affirms this actually twice in his, in his uh, response. And, and this is the third retelling of this account. <laughs> right? Luke believes this is worth us slowing down and paying attention to, which is why we're taking a, a bit of time going through this story as it's told and then retold. This is pivotal. This is critical, and there are lots of issues to uncover. Tom Wright again remarks, we can only conclude for that for Luke, the admission of the Gentiles into God's people reformed around Jesus without needing to take on the marks of Jewish identity, like circumcision and food taboos, was, the, was one of the central and most important things he wanted to convey. So something's going on for Luke's readers that he wants to get this point in there. Remember, remember this, is a, this is a historical document that has been offered to a Roman person trying to help them understand what is this new movement of God. So we got to remember that that's the context that we're in. And so this is very, very important to Luke um, and then, of course, to his audience. So back in verse 4 here, Acts 11. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. And this happened three times and was all, and was all drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived in the, in the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. 
Note that, that Peter refers to Jesus as Lord. And the, the voice of Jesus says, what God has made clean, don't call common. And the Spirit told me to go, right? This Trinitarian view early on in the Christian movement. He goes on and says, these six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had been or he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. Mm, Remembering that. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this is from Acts 1-5, Jesus' final instructions before taking his place on the throne, his ascension, right? And this links what is happening, just like what happened at the beginning, right? That, that what happened at Pentecost for the Jews. The, the Jews who had come to Jerusalem from all the nations, and now the link is to the, what the Spirit is doing going out into all the nations. It's a, a Gentile Pentecost. A, a coming of the Spirit for uh, a redo of that event, but now for a Gentile, a, a non-Jewish audience. And so Peter goes on in his logic in this story. He says, okay, if then God gave the same gift, the Spirit, to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus the Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Well, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. How good are you, God, that you have granted to the Gentiles repentance? What a gift, repentance, that leads to life. That's a beautiful response to to the accusation and, and Peter's then response and And what they declare is so true. It's the gift of life. The gift of the Spirit is the gift of life, which starts with repentance. I don't know if that gift is on your Christmas wish list or not. The gift of repentance. That's where you turn from the idols that you're bowing down to and turning you face Jesus. You're like, idols, you know, that's, that's not me. Uh, that was the, you know, the Gentiles and the Greek and Roman gods and the temples and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, yeah, the Gentiles did. They, they prayed and sacrificed all sorts of gods to ensure their safety, uh, fertility, um, both of their own um, lives and, and, and their children, but also their crops, you know, financial success, health, military success. Uh, even to be rescued in the afterlife. They prayed to all these gods, uh, to these idols. They bowed and gave up time and attention and money to these certain things to secure these different aspects in their life without trusting in the one creator God. That actually sounds more familiar, doesn't it? Who do I have to pay? What do I have to do? How do I assemble my life? How do I secure these resources so I don't really have to trust in God? There's a little check in our hearts, isn't there? And so we have to be careful of that. And so then then we turn when we look at, oh man, I'm over depending on this thing in my life or this person in my life. I'm over depending on them and I'm not turning to God. Well, that's when, we, that's when we, we ask for that gift of repentance that we could turn and face Jesus and realize he is the full picture. He is the, the image of the invisible God. He is the one that we should worship him and him alone. So, yeah, we have similar temptations to prop up certain institutions or ideas over Jesus, which is... Idolatry. It's been said, Tim Keller said, it's, it's when good things become ultimate things. That we know that 
that can't be taken away from me. I mean, we can we can have a free flow of good things in our life. He's you know comes in and it goes out. We, you know, this Thanksgiving we're we're experiencing gratitude over what God has given to us. It's a gift, and then we also share in community with other people that gift. It it comes and it goes. But when when we start hoarding whatever that is, whether it's attention, or hoarding money or food, or toilet paper, or whatever it is that we're hoarding, turkeys, whatever it is that we're hoarding, um, that, that we've, we can't have that taken away from us. It's my precious, you know? Those things we need to be careful of because they have, um, they have a power over us. Cornelius and his wide sphere of influence was granted this gift of repentance to receive life. True, that is true life. That's what, what that would be eternal life, right? The life of the Spirit of God in us, and you can have that same offer through believing in Jesus, through placing your trust in Jesus. And so, I'll be praying that you have the gift of repentance, that you can turn from these things that 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 can't be wrested away from you. You turn from those things and turn to Jesus. There's a simplicity in this passage that I, I really enjoy, but there's also some takeaways, I think, that we can draw from this, um, this encounter with Peter and the people who were really concerned that he had broken these taboos. And, and so I, I want to lead us into some takeaways. I, I found it very helpful the way Peter handled the, the critique of his home team. I found that insightful and, and inspiring. I think it can help you as well. So I just want to give you some how-tos. Uh, how to handle criticism for obeying Jesus. Right? Peter was obeying Jesus, obeying the voice of God and, and responding to the Spirit. And, and how do you handle criticism for when you are obeying what the Spirit of God is telling you to do? And sometimes you just have to share the story. You know, experience can be very subjective, but Peter tells the story of what God did through Jesus by his spirit and, and leaves it at that. Like, what else are you going to do? But Peter later, when he would be writing to, um, to the dispersed Jewish population, the followers of Jesus, he says, what credit is it for you, talking about servants um, and, and talking about, you know, really employees too, when you sin, what credit is it if you sin and you're beaten for it and then you endure? You know, that's, that's not a credit. But when, if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Right? He submits himself to the God who is the judge. And, and that's the way Peter says it too. It's like, well, let God be the judge of this. And here's a note to people with influence, whether that's pastors, um, whether that's parents, uh, maybe you're a business leader. Um, Peter doesn't say, how dare you come at me? I'm, I'm part of Jesus' inner circle. I'm above you. You just need to submit to authority. Peter actually tells the story of what God did through Jesus, by his Spirit, and leaves it at that. Here's something you might say. Well, what would you suggest I do? Here's, here's my situation. This is what I understand the, the command to be, and this is what I understand obedience to look like. You might say, I, I've wrestled with the claims of Jesus, and I'm convinced that he is who he says he is, and he's actually filled me with faith in him, with trust. And he's helping me turn away from the things that I used to lean on for my identity and for safety and for happiness. What else could I do in response? You, in a sense, by telling that story of your allegiance to Jesus and, and the way you, you feel you need to obey, you put that on them. What do you suggest I do in response? Because if God is who he says he is, if Jesus is the Lord of all, then I need to respond in this way. Don't I? Because obedience 
is key in a scenario like that. Okay, so that's, that's just an idea on how to handle criticism for obeying Jesus. Here's one. How to create unity in the body of Christ. Okay, well, that's actually a trick question. You, or you, you don't actually create it, right? You don't create unity. You actually are supposed to make every effort to maintain what has already been produced. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6, uh, this is Paul speaking to the church in, in uh, t- what is now modern-day Turkey. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, eager to maintain, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, because there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We do need unity in the church, but we already have it. We just need to maintain it. So our job is not to create unity, but to preserve it in humility and in gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love the way of Jesus. Could, can we say that? That's, yeah, that's the way of Jesus. So we need to preserve the unity in the way of Jesus. Okay, another, how to keep the goal in mind. Like, what's the goal of all this anyway? The goal of our salvation is to be united with God, united with the Trinity in his life and purposes. That's what eternal life is. It starts now, this quality of life, and it it goes on eternally with God because we're then united with him in his life and purposes because God has always wanted to dwell with his people. That's what the Garden of Eden was about. He wants to dwell with his people. His presence among his people is paramount. Absolutely top. He wants to be with his people. And the main thing, even in the Hebrew scriptures, was that the God of Israel would dwell with his people as his possession. He would dwell among them. That would set them apart from all other nations. The other nations who would have like an idol in their temple, no, we don't have that. We have God, his presence, his very presence here among us. And boy, we need to be careful, right? In response to this grace of his provision and presence, this life of God, they were then to live in the ways that kept them separate from their neighbors. That, no, we don't do things like they do. And Yahweh, the creator God, would talk about them as as his bride. Israel, you are my bride. And we know that in a marriage, you do certain things to express that commitment. For me, I wear a wedding ring to let other people know that I am taken. Right? This is, she is my wife, and she wears a ring too. And so then I act in faithfulness to my vows because I'm married. That's not what makes me married. <laughs> it's, it's how I act in response to being married. I, I love and, and cherish my wife to further the relationship and deepen it. That's right. So the question is, and it will continue to be, what sets the people of God apart to be his possession? What's the mark? What are the boundaries to identify the true people of God? Is it circumcision? Is it food laws? If God is indwelling these Gentiles, though, what more can we ask of them? Because remember, that's the goal, that God's presence is here among us. Last one, how to keep your theology in the front seat. How do we keep the main thing the main thing? If God is with us, that's really all that matters. And if God is among the Gentiles, well, that's all that matters. So case closed, right? But the Jewish believers struggled, uh, well, most of them, some of them struggled to let go of circumcision as the symbolic entry point into the real faith. Um, And they were being affected, as most of us are, by the politics of the day. 
There was a pressure group. There was a Jewish nationalist movement even back in the time of Jesus and all the way through before Jesus came, during when Jesus was there, after in this, in this moment, in these years, this Jewish nationalist movement that Jesus spoke against was still bubbling up. Remember Jesus would say things like, I want you to turn the other cheek. Don't, don't instigate more violence. Love your enemy. Choose the pathway, the narrow road that does not lead to destruction. He would weep over Jerusalem because he could see them headed toward this conflict with Rome. And he knew he could, if, he could, if he, they would just listen to him and choose the pathway of peace and follow his way, that they wouldn't have to be destroyed. But that generation, as predicted by Jesus, would eventually try to throw off Rome and come to a crushing defeat by the year A.D. 70. The temple destroyed um, completely uh, wiped out. Jerusalem uh, is, is completely destroyed and the Jews are scattered throughout the world. And it was very difficult for Israel to keep those old politics in the back seat. <laughs> How do I, this, this, this thought of like, okay, but yeah, but we're, we got to, we got a Jewish pride and we got to have national pride and we got to make, that's the, no, that's not the front thing. The front thing is that Jesus is Lord and his kingdom is coming. And his politic rules the day. And his character leads the way. And that was, was a problem. That is the problem. And we've talked about how the Spirit can fill us and, and keep us moving in that direction. But we've got to learn to stand for Jesus in the way of Jesus before we stand for any particular ideology that we want to defend. Let me say that again. We've got to learn to stand for Jesus in the way of Jesus with his character, gentleness, humility, before we stand for the ideology that we want to defend. He must be on the rise and our ideologies must take the back seat. He must increase and, and we must decrease. Earlier this year, uh, columnist Shadi Hamid uh, wrote an article entitled America Without God, How Politics Replaced Religion in America. And his main idea is that as religious faith has declined, ideological intensity has risen. Uh, Hamid notes the, the rapid decline of church attendance in the last 20 years from 70% to 50%. And Shadi says this, he says, if secularists hoped that declining religiosity would make for more rational politics, oh good, the religious people are going away and now we'll have more rational politics, uh, drained of faith's inflaming passions, they are likely disappointed, he says. As Christianity's hold in particular has weakened, ideological intensity and fragmentation have risen. American faith, which is what he, he just calls kind of this idea of America. And American faith, it turns out, is as fervent as ever. It's just that what was once religious belief has now been channeled into political belief. Political debates over what America is supposed to mean has taken on the character of theological disputations. This is what religion without religion looks like. So it's the wild frontier of political wrangling, right? Because ideological intensity is just um, through the roof. He asks this question, can religiosity be effectively channeled into political belief without the structures of actual religion to temper and postpone judgment? Oh, because there's just this ready to judge, isn't there? Yeah, we, Peter says we, we entrust to the one who judges and we leave that final judgment there. Shadi says, there is little sign so far that it can have the temperance and postponement of judgment. He says, if, if, if matters of good and evil are not to be resolved by an omniscient God in the future, then Americans will judge and render punishment now. That's kind of what we're seeing. You don't have to agree with everything that Shadi Hamid says or or thinks to know that there's something there that that we're noticing in our in our lives right now. 
And so let's just think about this. Before we stand and represent our values, let's stand for Jesus in the power of the Spirit and represent Him. I'm not saying we don't stand and present values and share those things and stand up for the marginalized and the hurt and the broken and, and put ourselves in the way of, of people who would assault us or assault other people. You know, no, but can we do this in the way of Jesus? Following his example of, of suffering and trusting to God who judges justly. So may God help us as we put our priorities back in line to show the world that Jesus is Lord, but, but also what Jesus is like. To show our neighbor that Jesus cares about them. To show our relatives, you know, maybe over the last carved bird from the grocery store as the, as the stock runs out, as we show our relatives the grace that we've received from Jesus Christ. I've received this gift of grace. I'm going to offer it as well. I'll just kind of say it again. If you're dead set on taking a stand about a political issue, remember, Jesus didn't ask you to die on that hill. He died on that hill far away to reconcile people to God and to each other. At that foot, at the foot of that old rugged cross. And when we get up from kneeling at At the emblem of suffering and shame, we stand to declare our love for Jesus and the love of Jesus for us lost sinners. As we go into communion and think about the suffering that Jesus did, as he uh, he committed no sin, no no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. From 1 Peter 2. As we, as we think about that, um, we need to think about the fact that we are called to give our lives to Jesus. Ultimately, in baptism, we realize that our lives are dead. You know, we are dead to the old life and raised to a new life. And our lives are at his expense, whatever he wants to do with them. And so sometimes it's been required. And, and I've been learning about martyrs, uh, people who have given up their life for Jesus all over the world, and sometimes it's called to, to to give up your life for Jesus. But he never tells us to give up our life for another cause. He doesn't tell you you have to forfeit your life for that. He says, give your life to me. And so we have to be careful uh, the, the, the expend- about the expenditure of our life and our energy. For the name of Jesus first, right? And uh, we celebrate him. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Hmm. Jesus, we remember your suffering. We remember how you gave yourself for us. What a gift. And now you've given us the Spirit. You, you are the giver of all um, good gifts, and we're so thankful for that. We realize that suffering will come for those who follow you. Help us not to be foolish and, um, and suffer uh, for just being um, difficult, <laughs> for being divisive. Lord, lead us to your, uh, to your heart for others this, this Thanksgiving season and this holiday season. Um, we ask that you would just bless us and, and encourage your people today. He also gave the cup. He said, this is the new covenant. Remember, the old covenant was bounded by um, priest and temple and and sacrifices. The new covenant is his sacrifice. And it's the entrance to the new covenant is is in his blood. He says, drink this uh, as you remember me. Who holds the keys that set us free?
Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, feel free to um, point other people toward this resource. You can find us on, on the web at issaquah.cc. Um, you can find our Facebook groups and Facebook page and, and YouTube and all those different things are out there as well. We want to connect with you. And if you're considering um, year-end giving, uh, we would love to um, make your list of uh, contributions. Uh, if you could uh, just go to issaquah.cc slash give. Um, we are really hoping that God will give us um, kind of a, enough money to, to be able to make some advances forward um, with some, some staff that we've been trying to hire. Uh, and so you can reach out to me. You can find more details about that um, on, on the web, issaquah.cc slash give. We love you. We're so thankful that you joined us. And may God richly bless you until we meet again.